The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff at the University of Maryland. From the University of Maryland, this is Policy Watch with Doug Besheroff. From the days of our founding fathers to the college campuses of today, from the dinner table to the halls of Congress, Americans struggle to balance their need for self-expression with common courtesy. Can a society based on equality both maintain order and continue to respect an individual's right to free speech? Today we discuss the history of etiquette in the United States and its importance in today's society with Judith Martin, also known by her pen name, Miss Manners. And now, Doug Besherov. Judith Martin, also known as Miss Manners. Welcome to Policy Watch and the University of Maryland. Thank you. We're delighted to have you here. Now, also known as, or AKA, Miss Manners, but you weren't always Miss Manners. You I was always mannerly. Yes. <laughs> But no, I was a reporter at the Washington Post for 25 years, a film critic, a drama critic, covered the zoo beat. I used to cover the sex life of the original pandas before this pair. So, yes. Well, <laughs> Only they didn't have any, so that was what we were covering. <laughs> when, you, when you were um, covering the White House, the social side, who was president? Well, I did it as a sort of secondary reporter. I was very young, and I started with, I guess, the Kennedy administration. And uh, on through uh, the time I got into this line of work, well, until the style section started, really. Um, but Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon. Really? Now, does, did covering the White House give you ideas about manners and etiquette, or how not to? <laughs> <laughs> um, People have the idea that the more formal the situation, the more manners, it's the only place where manners are relevant. And it's really not true. Um, yes, you need certain manners there, but if you can eat your dinner without spitting, you're all right. Because you've got aides to show you here and there. You've got a lineup of, of uh, people ready to rescue you. The hard situations are not the White House, it's the bus uh -huh. and the, uh, the highway. Uh, and the schoolroom. Well, we'll get to that in a minute, but there was one thing in the Nixon administration, I remember, uh, where he had these new uniforms made for the White House Guard. Do you remember that? I do. I covered that. Um, and they were sort of musical comedy type um, uh, uniforms, which he had to withdraw because, among others, uh, I made fun of them. Uh, because it's an age-old problem in America, in American politics, which, which George Washington wrestled with from the beginning, which is how do you show dignity and at the same time not look pretentious in a republic where everybody is equal? And that one urged on, uh, erred on the pretentious side. Other presidents have erred on the informal side. It's a very delicate balance. But let's go back to our first president, George Washington, who... I think it's widely uh, uh, felt, realized that almost everything he did was setting a precedent for good or for bad. Um, what was his approach to the formality? He liked more formal ways. He, when they were discussing how the president should be addressed, he thought your high and mightiness sounded kind of good. And somebody said, well, it's all right for you, you're tall, but what about the next person, and the next person was, going to be John, was Adams. John Adams, yes. Um, he did that. He um, uh, made the ruling that the president does not return visits, which in the days before instant messaging was an important consideration. Um, and he said he had the State of the Union, he had something like a throne that he sat on. The Congress was not allowed to question him afterwards. If they wanted to, they had to go out to Mount Vernon in their carriages, which was a long trip, and then they'd be on his turf. So he kind of liked this idea of, um, let's see a little respect around here. But didn't he also do things to make the office seem uh, like it was less regal? 
He wore broadcloth to his inauguration, for example. Well, he had to change because he had quite a satin wardrobe. Mm-hmm. He liked that sort of thing. But um, in all fairness, he, among others, all of the founding fathers, really, were brought up with um, the uh, an idea of court etiquette and um, uh, all etiquette. All the bowing and the bowing. Etiquette up in or... a stratified society, and they didn't like it. And they rebelled against it, and they knew there had to be an American etiquette, which they worked on. All of them, Jefferson particularly, wrote about etiquette. Uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin wrote about etiquette. They worked on this problem, which we still haven't solved, which is how do you have order and respect in a society where everybody is equal? And this was important to them for political reasons as well as just that they were angry at the British, wasn't this? They were trying oh, to make yes. a political statement. No, no, no. Statement. This was not a question of, of uh, oh, it's British and therefore we don't want to do it. I mean, uh, there were a lot of nice things the British did that they were only too happy to continue. Um, it was a question of they started a republic, a place where uh, everybody, all men in that time, was supposed to be equal, all white men, all property-owning white men. Um, well, we've had to make a few adjustments, but they allowed for that, right? And the, the concept was, uh, was very different, very radical, um, the dignity of every human being qua human being. And they wanted that expressed in their ceremonial functions and etiquette. They just, you know, did it a little gradually, so what would look stiff to us looked informal to them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you mentioned uh, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he did write about this, but he was much more extreme at that informality. Well, hour. he tried, bless his heart, he was trying to, to work out something that would uh, express this equality. So he said, all right, we will have no precedence whatsoever. And at his dinner parties, there was no order. Everybody rushed for the table because they were all equal. Uh, in fact, his inauguration as vice president, he went back to his boarding house and nobody would move over and give him a seat until finally... One old lady got a little upset at this, and she said, take my seat, and then they all got embarrassed. But um, on the other hand, he wrote an etiquette book for the legislature of Virginia to try and put a little order into the legislative process, because if you don't have any, you don't have political discourse. Well, it's, it seems to me that that is actually the perfect metaphor for the importance of rules of etiquette and, and, and theories of manners, because whether it was Jefferson's book or Robert's Rules of Order, um, the agreement about the behavior then enhances the ability of the institution to do what it's got to do. Absolutely. I mean, there is this misapprehension that etiquette inhibits people from uh, saying what they feel. Well, sometimes absolutely it does. We don't want to know what you feel about everything. Uh, remember that stage America went through where everybody said express everything you, you feel and People, you know, husbands and wives started saying, guess who I had an erotic dream about last night and things like that. It was really not a good idea. But, and we don't want to know if you think I'm, you know, overweight or too short or too tall or whatever. But in, when you're trying to do business, you have to get the personal out of there. You have to get the insults out of there. You have to have people talking in turn so that one person doesn't dominate. You can't have people shouting. And uh, so the etiquette rules of a legislature, um, when they follow them, uh, and of courtrooms, for example, are extremely strict. Now, when I was younger, I read Emily Post, and she didn't talk about this kind of thing. No, but she had, she did talk about consideration for others and that basic idea. Actually, the very first Emily Post book was very witty. They watered it down after that, but she was quite funny, yes. Um, and she talked, I mean, her, her whole principle was that uh, we're trying to get along <laughs> and in an orderly fashion. And, uh, of course, people seized on it for social climbing. And they thought, oh, well, that's the way the rich people behave. I'll do that. But she has the, princi- the real principles in there. But you have taken those principles much further. I was surprised as I started to read your body of work. Uh, you're almost a social philosopher. Thank you, except for the almost. (laughs) Now, the interesting question is, was mentioning that polite or not? Uh, I'm sure you meant it politely. (laughs) But it is the case that you've written 
much more broadly than how to behave at a dinner party. And you've described... Well, that's yeah. the, the mistake, that it's only at a dinner party that people have to know how to behave. You have to know how to behave at the movies or people can't hear the movie. Um, you have to, I mean, it's much more crucial out there um, uh, in everyday life than it is on a, a specified um, occasion. How does that work its way into our politics today? I must say, when I listen to the politicians today, they sound a little harsher and more willing to be critical than... I know. Like when that. I travel, people always say, what about those rude people in Washington? And I say, hey, I was born in Washington. I'm not rude. Who are you talking about? You're talking about the people you sent us. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And why did you send them? Well, of course we know, to get them out of their towns. Right? <laughs> but there is a, uh, a terrible misconception that people who have strong moral feelings, who are very virtuous uh, about one issue or another, cannot bother to be civil to other people. And therefore, in, uh, in campaigns, you have the electorate saying, oh, we can't stand these rude politicians. And then they vote for the people who are most rude and who are nastiest. And who because, do the attack ads. Because they say, well, but they really feel strongly about it. And they will get something done. Well, they don't get something done because we have a cooperative form of government. And if you cannot um, work with other people, you don't get anything done. So they vote for them. And then a year later, they turn around and they say, oh, you, you Washington, you're full of rude people. You know, uh, sorry. But it is a big mistake, and it's thought throughout the line. It isn't just politicians. People who take up a cause uh, that may have be full of virtue think it gives them the right to be rude to others. Besides writing a book, is there something to do about that? Well, I'm devoting my whole career to it. I could use all the help I can get. You want to be a social philosopher with me? <laughs> Almost. Almost. <laughs> Almost. But it does seem as if there are so many um, other forces that conspire against toning down the rhetoric. TV talk shows, for example, uh, where people shout at each other, interrupt each other. They're shows. They're talk shows. You know, when I was a, uh, when I was a, a movie critic and I had already started the Miss Manners column, people started in, on saying, why are they so rude in the movies? said, you want to see a movie about a bunch of polite people sitting around being polite to one another? It's conflict. This is show business. You rather ask yourself, why are people taking their manners from talk shows and things like that? Right. Uh, you ask what the answer to an uncivil society is. It's child rearing is what it is and self-restraint. You were once told by your father that you can tell what a society does wrong by what rules it establishes. Yes, this is how I got into my interest in, in history and in etiquette. Um, my parents said that if you um, look at the rules of a society, and they were thinking of laws, uh, I think, rather than etiquette, but if you look at the rules, whatever they're being told not to do, that's what they're, they're doing. doing. Otherwise, you wouldn't have to tell them not to. <laughs> and there's no law against my um, taking my wallet out of my purse and putting it in your pocket. But there is one, because I'm not likely to do it, but there is one against my taking your wallet and putting it in my pocket. Um, yes, what do you tell children? Mm -hmm. The most important, I mean, a million different things because we live in a complicated society. But the one most important thing, which you are not born knowing and most people never learn, is there are other people in the world and you need to take their feelings into consideration. It doesn't mean you need to yield to them all the time, but if we want a pleasant society, um, you have to show some restraint and consideration of other people. And that's done constantly. When a parent says, you know, don't pull the dog's tail, how would you feel if the dog pulled your tail? And the kid thinks, what? I don't even have a tail. What are you talking about? But the idea is uh, you have to think about the feelings of others. And why don't parents do that? Oh, there are probably a lot of reasons. Mostly they don't want to be negative with their children. Uh, they really do believe their children are the only people in the world. God bless them for thinking so. Uh, we all need parents like that. But it, it is an uh, unkindness to the child to allow a child to grow up not knowing how to deal with other people in a, uh, a pleasant way. And it almost seems as if we're asking institutions of society to substitute, whether it's yes. preschool or whatever. The same people who ought to be doing the job 
the parents, very often the clergy, are set, railing against television for not doing the job. Why is it the job of the entertainment industry? And they see sports stars, why don't they behave better? Because they're sports stars and they're not supposed to be etiquette instructors. You are. In your wonderful, freshly updated Miss Manners Guide to Excruciatingly, excruciatingly Correct Behavior, you talk about the new etiquette. What is the new etiquette as opposed to the old etiquette? Well, I don't make that clear a distinction. We love tradition. There are things that follow. One thing builds on another. But etiquette always changes and progresses. We try not to let the word out because then people want to change things for themselves. And they say, fine, I'm changing it and I'm doing this. I'm, I don't have to write thank you letters. I don't have to answer invitations. Well, they're not looking at the big picture and you will always have to do that uh, if you want to be polite. But life changes. Um, our philosophy of life changes. We have two new technology. Um, we Cell have new ways of living. So yes, and etiquette has to regulate all of these things. But are there other changes? Um, we are a country now that has a, suddenly an influx of immigrants. We are. We have more immigrants. We as started a percentage. out that way. If you yes, recall. but then we went 50 years. <laughs> Not so without. sudden. We went with 50 years. Yeah. Well, years we've always had immigrants, and uh, and we pride ourselves on that. Um, but you have to have, and, and we, we love the different um, cultures that have gone, gone into making up America. And as a matter of fact, American manners, which people think are sort of watered down English manners, are very much influenced by many different cultures and continue to be. However, we have to have an overriding etiquette that everybody understands. So when the well-meaning people who say, oh, well, it must be a custom in his country to whatever, um, that's not the point. You're here and you have to, and also they say it about the most ridiculous things. Well, of course it gets drunk on the street. That's what, in this, his country, no, it's not all right in this country. Um, but uh, you have to have, uh, it's the language of human behavior and people have to understand one another. You spent a fair amount of your uh, childhood abroad and I'm sure you've traveled since. Are the patterns of etiquette in other countries changing as well now? Yes. Um, America is now the single most important influence on etiquette everywhere in two ways. There are countries that were not um, democracies before and suddenly have to wrestle with this question of how do you behave when everybody's equal. And then there are countries that are you know, vehemently against this and are trying to, uh, to suppress any, any such notions. Uh, but it is the single biggest um, uh, influence now. But the Brits are still relatively class conscious, well, aren't they? Yes, but they're much, and let me give you an example, much less so. I remember, you probably do too, when one of the most devastating things an Englishman could say is that so-and-so is in trade. Mm -hmm. That was really supposed to make you curl up and die. And um, America always believed in the dignity of labor. No matter how rich you are, if you're not doing something useful, um, you are considered ridiculous. And um, now you have a situation where every you know, junior twig from the royal family, from the British aristocracy, is a photographer or runs a boutique or does something. They learn that from us. Now, there's something else that's gone on. It's almost like the devolving of uh, elites. The richest, most famous among us, I'm thinking of Steve Jobs and so forth, they wear T-shirts and blue jeans instead of fancy suits. There seems they did that symbolically um, in order to indicate that they were young, hard-working geniuses. And um, they don't always do it. Um, there are situations where they want to symbolize that they are part of the power establishment and they dress that way. So people forget that clothing is highly symbolic and everybody reads it and everybody denies it. And they all say, oh, I just want to be comfortable and I express myself and so on. But um, if you get into trouble and you have a good lawyer, there will be a big discussion of how you dress because they know that the jury will be looking at you and if you have a t-shirt that says blank you, they're not going to believe that you respect society and the law. Uh, and so on up. And so you see rock stars who come into court and you don't recognize them because they've had haircuts and they're wearing suits and mm -hmm. the jewelry is gone and so on. 
because they know that people do read clothing symbolically. Now, what is the business? The NBA just established a rule. What is that all about? Same reason. It's, 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 it's the same thing there. They don't want them going around looking uh, like thugs. Well, at the risk of pushing the point further than we should, is that an attempt not just to make them look less like thugs, but to change their behavior? It is always the hope of etiquette that if you behave well on the outside, some of it may get through to you. It seeps in. It's not a one-on-one -on -one thing. But people say, well, should, you have to write a thank you note when you don't really feel grateful. Yes, and maybe if you write enough of them, you'll begin to feel grateful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Maybe not, but you'll still be pleasant to deal with. <laughs> Well, this sounds like a version of what the Greeks used to say. I think they describe character as habit. I think that's very true. Yeah. So we should tell our children to say thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they may come to feel some gratitude. Who knows? <laughs> now, there's been one giant issue of the last um, few months, few years, and that is the relationship between the West and its views and the Muslim world. And it was reflected in part by the reaction of Muslims to the depiction of the Prophet Muhammad. We're used to depictions of Jesus Christ and Moses and whatever. Um, there's not a specific prohibition in um, Judeo-Christian religions against depictions of human beings, let alone the prophet. But that is a, a, a major prohibition for Muslims. How should we think through the, the, the almost the clash of civilization, or at least the clashes of etiquette about this question? You have two separate um, strains to this. One is freedom of speech, and I'm a great believer in freedom of speech. Does not mean I think you should go around offending people, but there are times when you do, and, um, and then you take the consequences for offending them. Now, the consequences should not be explosives and violence, uh, but if you recall, you say we're used to it. You remember when, uh, I think, Mayor Giuliani in New York got terribly upset over a depiction, uh, a Christian depiction, I forget exactly what it was, I think it involved urine and I don't know what else, but you're, the, the answer is, it's an etiquette violation, and etiquette violations upset people. Yes. Um, it is, yet nevertheless, uh, a freedom of speech thing, and it should not be illegal. But should we, as a matter of etiquette, not publish pictures of the Prophet Muhammad? Uh, depending on what reason you're, you're, you're publishing them for. I mean, I, the... Um, if you have a mandate to let people know what's going on and you need to do this, absolutely. Do you do it socially when you're going to offend somebody? No, that's the difference. Um, as I say, I'm a great believer in freedom of speech, but you, in situations where this is not crucial, you voluntarily restrain yourself in order not to offend people. Now, I was surprised in reading your columns. I think you're a supporter of speech codes at universities. I am. Yes, I am, because you need them, just like um, everybody, I think, I hope, is a supporter of speech codes in the courts of law. Um, should you be able to curse out the judge and scream and things like that? Well, no, um, not only as a matter of dignity, but because you have business to conduct, mm -hmm. uh, which is to let both sides be heard so that justice can be found. In a, cla in a classroom situation, Again, you need uh, people to be able to speak out and to speak freely. Um, and when it reaches the point of personal insult and or general insult that intimidates people, then you have um, subverted the purpose of the institution. Why is it if I'm driving along and someone cuts in front of me and I hunk the horn, the other person is the person who makes a gesture to me? because there are a lot of rude people out there. Now, I presume you're honking the horn to warn that person of danger or danger to you or whatever. And danger not, to me. And not to be, well, danger to you, that he's cutting you off and that not because you're going to be late, but because he might hit you. Um, but, there, of course, there are a lot of, lot of people. I don't need to tell you about road rage. I mean, this is a major problem in this, in this country uh, because, again, there is that I'm in a hurry and I'm not aware that, 
of the feelings or I don't care about the feelings of others, so I must be the only one in a hurry to get out of my way. Well, I'm glad that's, you said that. Without etiquette, that's the rule. Well, look, on that note, it is time to turn to our audience for questions. Um, so could I ask those of you who have any questions to come up to the mic? Hi, I'm Lisa Solomon. I'm curious to see if you think that political correctness is a good thing or a bad thing. Um, it depends on what you mean by it. When people use the term political correctness, they will give you an example of, that is so ridiculous where somebody has made an issue and taken offense where obviously no offense was meant. And so then they say it's terrible. And before they know it, they're in the position of defending bigotry because it was an enormous advance, as we discussed earlier here, when it no longer became socially acceptable to air prejudices and uh, deliver put-downs to people in that way. So, in, in fact, I think it was a wonderful thing. But I'm aware that when people use the term, they mean something, uh, a, an outrageous example of somebody picking a fight over nothing. Judith Martin, Miss Manners, thank you very much for being with us. This program was produced by the University of Maryland, which is solely responsible for its content. The Norman and Florence Brody Family Foundation is dedicated to exploring topics of national and international importance and is proud to support Policy Watch with Doug Vesheroff at the University of Maryland. We are PBS. 